Thanks, Susie. Good morning, everyone. So we have this morning, um, we have put together a panel that's called Demystifying Undersea Cables or Submarine Cables, whichever way you want to call it. So we have um, uh, Samia Bahsun, who is a cable builder, and we have Paul Kerwin, who's a cable operator and who runs the services on the cables. So what we have put out for you as an agenda is basically we want this to be uh, an education session on um, submarine systems. So everything you ever wanted to ask about submarine cables, now's the time to ask. So we will start uh, from the beginning. So we'll start from building a cable, how do we build a cable, and then we'll go through all the development uh, process, uh, who are the key partners in building a cable, uh, what are the typical ownership structures? And also we'll do comparisons on the various ownership structures. As a second part, we'll show you who gets involved into building, how long it takes to build a cable. And after that, we'll go into the service layer, what kind of services you can buy on submarine cables. Um, as you know, the um, Internet is a very large consumer of submarine cables. It is by far um, the cause of demand for submarine cables, uh, which wasn't the case 10 years ago. So uh, we have with us Samia here. Samia uh, was um, an engineer, at, uh, an R&D engineer at Bell Labs, and then she moved to executive functions with P&L Accountability. She has expertise in wireline, wireless, terrestrial, subsea, microwave, long haul metro and access systems. She's a real expert in fiber optics. She consulted for Nokia Siemens, Alcatel, AT&T, IDT, Lucent, Tyco, and TerraWorks. She's also an entrepreneur and she founded a, her own company and she, uh, that company, uh, did some fiber optics characterization services called FiberWorks. Um, we have here Paul Kerwin. Uh, Paul has 26 years of experience in the telecom industry. Uh, most of that experience is with cable and wireless. He has recently joined um, Tata Communications. So he has had a wide variety of roles in the carrier business ranging from customer support, global account management, service management, and commercial and operational management. So we will start now with uh, Samia's presentation, and we will take questions at the end. Um, unless some things, things are not clear and you, you're absolutely burning for a question, uh, you can come to the mic, but we would would like to have the two presentations first and then entertain questions at the end. Thank you. Samia. Good morning. The first thing I wanted to clarify about demystifying cables is I prefer to use the word undersea. In 1985, when I started working with Bell Labs and I was telling people, you know, I work on, a, on submarine systems, they looked at me and they're like, I wasn't sure whether they were impressed or horrified, but I think they didn't want to, to bank their national security on me. So let's call it from now on under sea fiber optic cable. So this map that we are showing is uh, the current map of all the systems uh, that are laid around the planet. Uh, the systems that are there are uh, either current or in planning phase. Uh, and to be on the map, they had to be announced um, by December 2007. So this is very, this is the latest map. Okay, I just removed yep, your map, Sylvie. Well, thank you very much anyway for the intro. So the first part of my talk is going to be really a technical overview. I mean, Sylvie mentioned I was a cable builder. I would, more precisely, I'm really a cable designer. I don't want to take responsibility for the fishermen fishing out the cable and breaking it. You can laugh, you know. <laughs> so these are the parts of a fiber optic, uh, of an undersea fiber optic system. In terms of demystifying, it's really not that complicated. It's a, it's a transmission system. 
And unfortunately, I do not have a pointer, but so I'll walk you through it. In bet uh, at the middle of, um, you know, between the two shores, the green, of course, are the land side. And you have what you see, lines. And in the lines, you will see fiber cables, as pointed in. You will see repeaters. And I'll discuss every one of these components through this talk. And you'll have branching units. And then on the terminal equipment, you will have what, you know, you have all the transponders and everything. And you also have the cable station where it's, it's all included. And, you know, I'll, I'll give a talk for about 10, 15 minutes on this. And please, uh, you know, at the end of the talk, you'll, you'll, any question you have, please feel free to do it. So let's talk about the cable. I mean, it's really from a mechanical perspective, cable design in undersea is a very, very impressive mechanical endeavor. And what you see in here, you see at the, you know, at the very thin end of that, of that big cable, you see the fiber. And really the fiber is no thicker than my hair. I mean, not the whole hair, but really one strand of hair. And it's about a 125 micron in diameter altogether. It's really, really very small. And this is where all your traffic is being carried. And in order to protect that cable, you basically have some steel around it. You have a copper conductor. And one also of the reason of the copper conductor is that also you have to power your electronics in the ocean by sending power through this conductor. And of course, around it, you have a polyethylene insulator. And what you see, the last stage of that cable is a steel armor. And you don't always use it when you go into deep, really deep ocean. But as you get closer to the shore and to more um, challenging territory, you start using the, the steel armor. And we call it armored cable versus lightweight cable on your right hand side. This, I would say, is absolutely the most impressive piece of equipment in the undersea, uh, in undersea cable systems. Impressive, why? Because your entire design, the entire design of any system you have out there and the progression of cable system and their capacity resides in the design of that element here. Not only from the physical standpoint, because it has to withstand depths, you know, uh, the deployment can go up to 8,000 meter in depth. Can you imagine the amount of water pressure on that? And they call it a repeater. And its function, its primary function is to amplify your signal. As you send the signal from the shore end and it travels through the cable, the cable has some attenuation and you get into that repeater and it amplifies it as shown in the little diagram here, and then it sends it out to the next repeater. Now, the reason I'm saying this is a really challenging part, look at the, the, uh, the big box down here. It says four amplifier pair repeater. What that means is that you have four pair of fibers coming into that repeater. And you can, today's repeater can take up to eight pairs of fibers. But even more important is each of these boxes here on top, as you see, you know, it's like, a, you know, you have this, uh, what do you call it, hexagon. And each one of them carries an amplifier pair. But if I were to take you back about 10 years, you know, in the, in the early 1990s, when I started working at Bell Labs, actually in 1985, we were working on TAT-8. And TAT-8 was a regenerative system Meaning, every one of these boxes, instead of having an optical amplifier, had almost what you would see today as the electronics, the high-speed circuitry in the terminal equipment. So every time you change your terminal equipment, you needed to change that repeater. However, with optical amplifier technology, and you've heard the words DWDM, I'll go through a slide to explain to you a little bit what it is. But through optical amplifier technology, you're able to keep that repeater in the water and add capacity on demand. And, and the optical amplifier itself is bitrate 
and format independent. Unfortunately, you cannot always have your cake and eat it too. There, there are impairments, and a lot of the design of that cable system has to take place in that space. And you know, later on, I'll talk a little bit about the commercial <coughs> aspect, but some of the surging capacity, and if you notice that capacity has become cheaper and cheaper, is precisely because of that invention, the optical amplifier. What you have also, if you look at the upper right-hand corner here on the, on, the, on the slide, what you have is a branching unit. So why do we really need branching units? So imagine if you wanted to carry traffic from one side of the ocean to the other side of the ocean, and then you wanted to carry traffic from that same side of the ocean to another part of the continent. You would need really two cable systems, right? If you didn't have a branching unit. Within an, the branching unit as well, you could have it as a passive branching unit. It should just take your signal and, and split it off, but also it could be an active branching unit. And the challenges of this branching unit are that you also have to power them. Then we go to the cable systems. Now we're, we're, now we're getting submerged. As we submerge ourselves and we go into the shore, you go, I mean, you basically, what you do, look at this picture. Um, whoops, it wasn't captured here, so I apologize. So basically what you do, you come in from the sea and you drag your cable in and you trench it and you basically terminate your cable into a terminal office. And this is where your entire traffic is happening. And uh, Paul, I believe later when he's going to talk about services, as you know, it's, it's interesting because there is an evolution in this whole thing, is the cable station were exactly near the shore because it really costs a lot of money to actually trench the cable, terminate it. At that point, you're actually getting some armoring in the cable. But today, because of the technology, because of the lower losses in fiber, because of the tremendous amount of capacity that you can actually put on those cables, is going, it start, you know, the, the, the cable station is more or less remotely located from the beach. And then you can start blending your services in. So let's see what's in that cable station. As I mentioned, you have all your terminal equipment in there. So the first element, which really, uh, you know, I, it, it's, it's, it's an expensive piece of uh, network equipment, is at the bottom here in the middle, it says PFE, is a power feed equipment. You do not have the luxury undersea to just plug in your power system in some place. And basically balancing the power budget, actually how you power the system is very, very challenging. It's not just, you know, back of the envelope electronics. I mean mathematics. Above it, you see a line monitoring equipment. Okay, some of you are like, oh, you know, what's happening when the cable gets cut and everything? Where that piece of equipment, which is sitting in the cable station, thousands of kilometers away from that one repeater, 8,000 kilometers down at the bottom of the ocean, is able to tell you at, at any time what is the quality of your system. And also, if you have a fiber break, can you imagine, and, and you guys have experienced it, you know, during the Taiwan earthquake and other fiber breaks that have happened, but can you imagine if you needed to actually go search that ocean for the repeater that failed unless you had this line monitoring equipment? And again, the technology that went into it, Tyco, for example, uses a high-loss loopback. They put kind of a bridge, and it requires quite a bit of system and data analysis to identify the right cable cut. Uh, Alcatel, uh, Lucent, I think, I believe they use a supervisory channel, transmit and receive, and then they send signal to the repeaters. But bottom line is that you can, you can within, I would say right now, in some instances, you can within hundreds of meters really locate the cable cut, thanks to this piece of equipment. And it has evolved over the years also. Also, from a monitoring perspective, in your left-hand corner, 
You see that little computer, your craft terminal interface is your element management system. So when you terminate the cable in some little hut, you have you know, maybe just a craft interface that talks remotely to the system. But that piece of equipment and all the software behind it will, do, will really provide you with network management of this entire network and some supervisory. Um, but last but not least, you see on the, on the right-hand corner here a really tall piece of equipment. This is what you call the high performance. This is the terminal equipment. This is where your data is generated, sent into the ocean, and regenerated at the end. So I'm going to focus on that because, again, from a design perspective, when we talk about DWDM and wavelength division multiplexing, this is where the design has gone into. So far, so good? We call it a hippo, not really for hippopotamus, although we've been trying to tell Tycho to change that particular name. But it's really a terminal equipment. So what you have in here, you have, you know how you see one, two, and minus whatever. What you have, these are channels. These are wavelengths. What the wavelength is, and I apologize for those of you who really know the optical field, but I'll, I'll, I'll go back into the, you know, the, the details here. What the wavelength is, is a color of light. It's simply a color of light. So what happened is that you take, you take optical signals of different colors of light, and you combine them, you just combine them into this, what we call this WTE, which is a wavelength terminating equipment. So once you combine them all together, you're like, oh my God, they're going to be all mixed up and all, well, the beauty, the really the beauty of photons is that, the, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a gross simplification, but they really don't, don't interact. Every color of light is going to stay in that, you know, wh where it needs to be. But of course, as I mentioned, cable has loss. And you need to actually transmit over thousands of kilometers. So what do you do? Even at the terminal station, you first amplify it. Even when you go through the WTE, you kind of lose power per channel, right? You're combining. So the TLA is a transmit line amplifier. In reality, it's just another name for an optical amplifier. What it does, it takes all these wavelengths, and I believe today, today, we can transmit up to 96 wavelengths at 10 gigabit. This is where the word tera, terabits of information, you know, terabits of capacity is coming from. So you can package them so well because this optical amplifier is fabulous. It really takes anything in, in that wavelength range, which is in the 1.5 micron or 15-50 nanometer spectrum, and it amplifies it. But the trick is, so that was interesting, when I was in research actually at Bell Labs a few years ago, that was about uh, 1990, 1991. When we discovered optical amplifiers, there was a lot of resistance. Oh, this is new and this, you know. We found out they were really, really a very clean instrument. They do not introduce too much noise. And we told ourselves, oh, great. We're going to put one channel, it's going to get amplified. We put 10, they'll get all amplified equally. Well, as we all know, we are not all created equal, although we really like to think so. What happened is that the optical amplifier on its own has a profile. It has an amplification profile. And what you see in here, it favors some wavelengths over others. So just imagine, I've just taken some wavelengths, some, so many colors of light, each of them, each of them are carrying 10 gigabit of capacity. I take them through that amplifier, and guess what happened? The middle one gets really strong. This is a Darwinist law of optical amplifier. And the one at the edge kind of are left behind. But thank, thank God, you know, we have very good scientists out there that figured out a way to, to, to cheat the system. So, 
here I put the, opti the repeaters. So every one of them, by the way, every TLA, every optical amplifier is one of those boxes here. I just wanted to put it here in perspective. So what do we do? There is an element I didn't show you in the first view graph. It's called a gain equalizer. It's that little box in red. Looks like a repeater. It's boxed into a repeater shell. You know, we, we use a sim mechanical design, but it's a gain equalizer. So it looks like that. And what it does, it does exactly what I told you earlier. It equalizes the gain. So what we do, the wavelengths that, ha that are a little bit less favored, we give them a hard head start at the shore. We, what is called is, is, is a concept of pre-emphasis. Then it goes through your chain, and the, the wavelengths at the middle are catching up because the amplifiers and the repeaters are favoring them. And then you have this gain equalizer, which is placed not only in one spot. I mean, sometimes there are more than one in the, in the system. And it basically equalizes your, your channels, and it gets transmitted. It levels off the playing field, really. So now we have all the elements. We have the terminal equipment, which is dense wavelength division multiplexing with multiple channel of light getting transmitted. We have the, the repeaters, which are optically, you know, which are really optical amplifiers. We have the gain equalizers. We have the power feed equipment. You have the branching unit. You take all this equipment together. What do you do with it? Basically, you could configure it depending on you know, your geographical limits. So in transoceanic network, what you see on your left-hand side here, you have what we call a trunk and branch system. One thing about engineers, they're really good with equations. They're not very creative with names. So what we do is like, you know, you take, you take this whole optically amplified system, you go into a branching unit, and you go inland. And as you see, even the branches are on their own a repeated system. To the right side of that diagram, you have what we call the coastal network. So here you are, for example, on the east coast of the United States, and then instead of putting terrestrial cables, you know, when, you, when you're paying $100,000 per cable kilometer, you may consider going a little bit in deep waters. You have, so you go from city to city, and what you do, you do the same thing. It's a repeated system, you have a branching unit, and sometime from the branch, and this is again, you know, it, it's really tricky. You really have to understand you have to survey the ocean, and I'll talk about it later. There are a lot of people that get involved in the design of this thing. And really what happens is that you, you basically can trunk and branch them. And then what we have is repeatless system. Yes, they're out there, and they're great at times. Why are they great? Because they don't require repeaters. So if you don't have any repeaters, you have nothing to power. So you don't need any power feed equipment. Not only that, you don't need, I mean, the cable, it depends. Cable is the same. Sometimes it's a thin cable if it is in deep water. But often you have a lot of armor cable because they're really in inter-island and you're getting into rocky situation. So you have this point-to-point -point repeated system. And you could also have coastal networks that are short in distances that are also repeatless network. So it's up to the designer, you know, once somebody comes with a demand and say, this is what I want, is up to the designer to really make sure that they design the right system. It's a lot cheaper many, many times to have a repeaterless system than to have a repeated system. But of course, you can go across the ocean with it. So the total transmission lengths for a repeated system, I said unlimited. This is like really wishful. But right now, I think it's 11,000 kilometer, the longest system. 11 thousand kilometer that's a lot of kilometers the non-repeated is 400 kilometer a few years ago we could barely do a few years ago i'm talking six seven years ago not even you could barely do 250 kilometers there are new amplification methods called raman amplifier where actually people are using the fiber itself the fiber to act like an amplification medium. 
is fascinating. Electrical power, as I mentioned, there is no powering. The maximum number of fiber pairs in the cable is eight in the repeated, is 12 in the non-repeated. And branching units, it depends. You have mostly passive branching units. And right now, there is a new type of branching unit. It's called an optical add-drop add -drop multiplexer. And I won't even go in detail. It's just another way to saying you're splitting the signals and you're rerouting them and keeping the, the wavelengths integrity. And the maintenance, complex, simple. Obviously, when you have a long repeated system with all the elements in it and in depth, in water depths, is a lot more complex. And the cost, obviously, you're paying, I think the average is about 30 to 35,000, to maybe 30 to 40K, I don't want to quote anybody here, per cable kilometer for a repeated system is a lot cheaper for an repeated one. And I won't quote it because I'll get nailed by the vendors. So. Primary cost of system in construction. How much do they cost? So you have the network construction. The wet equipment is everything in the water, obviously. The dry equipment is a cable station and everything in, 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 in the cable station. The inst you have installation and testing. You have project management. You have terminal station building. And it's shore property. And if you've watched the real estate lately, you're paying a lot of money for shore property everywhere, even in New Jersey. As project startup, you have licensing and permits. You have the legal, you know, you have to hire the lawyers. I don't know if any of you had to deal with lawyers, but I promise you they're not cheap. And you have obviously people in the financial industry. The access cost is backhaul. As I mentioned, you have to dig through land. And the capacity cost. And then you have the operation and maintenance cost. And those are really not only during the construction of the cable, but they will be your biggest cost after the cable is built and installed. And how much do they cost? They cost anywhere between tens of millions of dollars to hundreds of millions of dollars. I'm talking 300, 400, $500 million cables. And if you look at the breakdown, and this is a beauty, and here in, in this histogram here, what you see, you see that the first upfront cost, when you go out there and install a system, your first cost is a cost of your wet plant. The repeaters, the cable, all that stuff. Then, and you have, and why is your dry plant cost so cheap? relatively speaking, because you're not loading the system completely. You're just putting what you need. But as you go further and further and implement, your dry cost becomes an increasing number of wavelengths for your system. Your dry cost, your, your terminal equipment, begins to take over the cost of your entire system. And it's really a balancing act. How much capacity? How much are you willing to pay? And what is it that you need? So I just mentioned this. It's like really cost tens of millions of dollars to hundreds. It takes 12 months to 24 months, and even more so for really big system to put them together. And it provides, I mean, I talk about terabits. Terabits is a trillion bits of information on one cable. It's amazing. You know, a few years ago, it was like 300 voice calls. You should like that, the ISP providers. And it provides high quality transport, irrespective of how many cable, you know, we always remember the bad stuff that happens to us. But you couldn't get today. Those components, those repeaters are designed for 25 year life and more. They're underwater. I mean, really, when you get the cable break is when procedures haven't been followed. When you have a cable sheet coming in, nobody's monitoring the area, and boom, they grab the cable and take it out. Or sometimes you have some shunt failure. You know, in some cases, if the cable is hanging, you have some sharks that get attracted to, to like some of the electromagnetic field in the cable and come and bite it. So it's pretty cool. Bell Lab had hired like a lot of biologists at some point in time to look at this. 
So really, it's, it's uh, and then the next part of this, so in summary, really, you're looking at something that is extremely, extremely reliable and very high capacity transport network. So thank you. This completes, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, So should I ask for a question now? No, I think you should continue. Yeah, how many two. more, how much more time do I have for the rest of it? Um, six minutes. Oh, six minutes, then that's great, because I won't bore you with commercial stuff. I heard you're a technical group. So I'll go really quickly through this. Okay, here is 3,000 kilometer cable. Implementation in about 24 months. So look at all the activities that take place pre-contract. You have to plan, procure, develop, and then you send a request for a proposal. Usually, when you're actually going through the pre-phase activities, people call, you know, ask for ROM, rough order of magnitudes. And I remember our clients hated them because you would give them a ROM estimate and all of a sudden you come down millions of dollars cheaper. And they're like, what happened? Oh, maybe if I wait a little bit longer, you'll drop the price. It's not really the case. The, once, you're, once a client is really committed to building a cable, once a company is really committed to put a cable in place, then you really, there are a lot of activities like the desktop surveys, those cost a lot of money. So we don't go into real details on these projects until there is a seriousness from the part of the client. And then you go all the way, you know, you do the detailed design and then, and then you commit the manufacturing because some of these repeaters used to cost us a million dollars a piece. It's a cheaper now, but it's really, they were that expensive. So you do not commit manufacturing until you're sure somebody wants it and it's designed for that particular system. And then installation you have to book and then of course post, you know, once, once you commission the cable you have the operations and maintenance. So I won't go through this. So you have a pre-contract. Who gets involved? Everybody. This is worse than the United Nations. The telecom carriers, the private investors, the government ministries. I'm not kidding. If you could actually get a cable done together, you could really run for office. And I'm really serious about this. Then you have the lenders, you know, the money guys, and then the regulators. You know, everybody wants a piece. Oh, why, do, you know, how much? And really people who are not all understanding the technology. Then you have, of course, the environmental agencies. I really have to, you know, I'll take one minute for this one. We were putting a cable. This is a land cable in San Francisco, uh, in, in the area, Point Arena to San Francisco, first optically amplified DWDM system in the world. You have no clue how much we had to explain to the environmentalist that this is really a harmless piece of equipment. Really, it's, it's amazing. But you know, you have to maintain those standards. And, I, and thank God for them too. And then you have the turnkey suppliers, you have maintenance administration, and of course you have people like me who want to get paid all the time and we're called the consultants. And then you have the lawyers. And those are terms, I'm not, you know, you have the presentation. Those are terms that you encounter, MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, Demand Forecast, all this, you know, this is jargon in our industry. So if somebody walks up to you, MOU is not MOU, it's really Memorandum of Understanding. And ITP, which is really the favorite place where, you know, it's called an intent to proceed, this is when you go out and celebrate. Okay, I'll give you really three more minutes for this. How do you procure them? It used to be you have three types of procurement. Traditional consortium, <coughs> private ownership, and hybrids. Not the hybrid that you see in your gaming, because I see this is a really young crowd. So it's really hybrid joined between the two. Traditional carrier consortium. A typical system is iMiwi for a traditional system, is joint development by carriers and owner who share the facility. People often say that this, the undersea cable business is really incestuous, it's like a big family. It is really true. By the time it takes to design a cable, do a cable, everybody works together, and the carriers are your AT&T, your, uh, your uh, Verizon, your Sprint, your uh, uh, BT, your Tata Communications, all these carriers, are really, you know, participate and you have consortium cable and they sit around tables and they're like the government sometimes, they take all their time, they like to wine and dine and, you know, and they talk about how to build the next best cable. And they take the requirement from you guys, the ISPs. 
who are generating, you know, the growth in demand. The private networks. This is interesting. I worked on the, well, before Global Crossing became Global Crossing, <coughs> I negotiated, I was actually, I, I had taken my R&D hat off and I became a commercial person. And it was very interesting. It was the first, it wasn't the first privately, uh, private company, but you know, they, when they did the Atlantic Crossing, I really had a good feel what it takes to, f to do these cables. I mean, these guys came up with $400 million. Just like that, investors. And they said, we want to put a transatlantic cable, Atlantic Crossing one at the time. And now you have a lot of companies, you know, that are coming uh, uh, on, you know, like VSNL, now Tata, and, you know, TGN has built their own private networks. But the way, actually, I want to go back to this one. The way on traditional owners sell capacity, because this is what you guys are using and are buying to transport your, your internet stuff, is sold by individual owners. You have people that call you and they say, you know, they sell you capacity on those networks to the carriers. The private network, they sell IRUs, which are irreversible right of usage. You own it for like 25 years. And they also can lease it. And they have published pricing. And sometimes those guys are really limited by the market. In traditional system, they decide it costs us so much, we're going to sell you that for that much. The private networks came in very competitively and they said, okay, this is a market demand and I'll sell you an ST and this is why the price of capacity had dropped tremendously in the rough times. And then you have the hybrid network. It's really nowadays because what we're finding out, you need both worlds. You need the private investors fronting a little bit the, ca the capital and also you need the carrier networks that are coming in and, and really building this. And the capacity pricing, it could be like the consortium but it also determined by market condition. So you have a mixture of both. Thank you. We'll now <laughs> no time for questions? We'll do after. Okay, yes. very good. Yeah. We'll take the questions after for all parts. Uh, now we'll move with Paul, and Paul will give us an idea of how these cables are dropped in the ocean and uh, what can happen to them um, when everything goes well and when everything fails. And also, he will give you um, a good overview of what are the services, <coughs> excuse me, what services uh, are offered on uh, cable systems. I should have had that to keep people on time. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, Samia uh, did a wonderful job, though. She actually stole some of my thunder, so you'll see some repetition, I'm afraid. But uh, thank you for my having me here. Um, most of my esteemed colleagues in the cable industry, submarine industry, and capacity are, are actually in a, a conference, a similar conference down in Washington uh, this week, in International Telecoms Week. So. Uh, for your sins, you've got me, the, uh, the, the poor substitute, but uh, I've been around cable systems That's for a very true. long time. Uh, <laughs> been, been around um, cable operators, cable depots, uh, y you name it. Um, there's, there's an awful lot goes into uh, submarine systems, as you just saw. And um, I've also been in, in the, uh, the, the IP and ISP environment, and uh, certainly um, a, a lot of folks seem, you know, it, it looks like, it feels like, and it is magic. And uh, it, it certainly takes an awful lot to deliver the tranches of capacity that we need in, in the industry today. And uh, when, when Samir talks about network upgrades and putting more terminal equipment in place, we're talking in tranches of uh, 320 gigabits at a time. So it, it's, it's a significant investment for all of the cable operators to go through the user groups, the forecasts and the demands to be able to um, uh, go back to investors or go back to the capital reserves and, and put more, uh, more, more equipment on the submarine cables that are already laid. So I'll just go through a quick agenda. Again, I think you've, you've just heard um, a, a very elaborate uh, description of, of cable systems. So some of this will be a little repetitive. 
uh, the, the fiber optics, the landing stations, the uh, you know what segments are: repeaters, cable laying, cable faults. I think you'll be interested in cable faults in particular because uh, quite a lot of you thought uh, there was quite a lot of uh, blogging and uh, conspiracy theory going on in, uh, around the Middle East in uh, earlier this year, and um, Flag uh, Reliance have found. Uh, satellite pictures of two ships that they, they suspect did all the damage to the cables. So they are going after them for insurance. Uh, I'll go through some of the products and services. I'll also talk a little bit about backhaul and terrestrial because as Samia talked about some of the cable systems and whether they're private or consortia or hybrid, they, it actually has some uh, bearing on who can provide backhaul services to those cables. Uh, we'll, we'll look ahead and see what uh, what cables uh, we're, we're primarily involved in, but also what the industry's in, involved in. So fiber optics, you, you've just seen a, a, a couple of photographs. Uh, the repeater going into the sea there on the, on the left-hand side. Uh, the repeaters, again, they are a remarkable piece of equipment. When you think that they've got to be uh, fault-free for 25 years sitting at the bottom of the ocean, uh, they, they are probably the most uh, elaborate and substantial piece of the, the cable system. And again, uh, another depiction of a branching unit. The branching units become the, probably the most costly. Uh, they're also becoming the most strategic point because you'll see that many cable systems are, are running long lengths. Uh, for example, uh, South Africa to um, the Middle East, up, up the East Coast. And yet, um, not all the countries have bought in. Uh, nobody knows what's going to happen with competition on the east coast of Africa. So uh, they, they strategically often design branching units into the cable ready for uh, the, the ability to put another landing into a country. So uh, they, they're, they're not only uh, useful at the early stage of a, of, of a life of a cable, but also throughout the life of a cable. Uh, and we're, we're actually just doing a piece of work between Guam and Tokyo and you'll see the cable system that we're going to uh, bridge into that. Uh, but we're actually going to take down the cable and insert a branching unit. So uh, again, uh, a change on the normal cable design where you're actually going back and you're going looking at the design and what can it take, how many fiber pairs can you divert, and so on. The, this, the uh, typical fiber optic cable, as you saw, um, <coughs> I do have an example here, so if nobody's ever seen one, uh, you may have all seen the, the fancy little insert, which is the, uh, the very small inner section of a, of a cable. This is actually a piece of recovered cable from the Caribbean, uh, which has obviously got a bend that is far greater than the, uh, uh, the normal radius that fiber optics can, can handle. So you're welcome to have a look at that. And I thank one of my colleagues bringing it from Miami to, uh, to Washington uh, over the weekend. He got some odd looks when he went through the airport. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cable landing station. This is our cable landing station in Wall, New Jersey. Uh, you will find that most of the cable systems, for uh, obvious reasons, the cable landings are very nondescript buildings. Uh, it, it houses the, uh, the generation. Uh, most of them have got dual power supply from the, uh, from, from the local utility. Uh, they then have multiple diesel generators, just like a normal data center would have. Uh, obviously, uh, very stringent uh, AC and, and DC UPS systems. Uh, the, the main thing also, which uh, Samir didn't mention, uh, on the PFEs, it, it's, you know, depending on the length of the cable, uh, again, the, the power equipment is one step ahead again because it's, it's constant current. And, and when constant current, I'm talking, some, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but 7,200 milliamps plus or minus one milliamp. It has to be absolutely perfectly clean. Uh, and we're talking thousands of volts DC, uh, 7,200 milliamps and, and uh, constantly fed and, and very, very clean. The cable laying, I think many of you, uh, if anybody's on the East Coast, if you drive up by Baltimore, you'll see the Tycom cable ships uh, just after the bridge on the right-hand side, a couple of gray-looking dower uh, ships. Uh, there, are, there are probably 12 companies worldwide that house their cable ships, and they strategically place them across the globe, uh, whether it's Baltimore, New Jersey, 
uh, Southampton, Bermuda, uh, Vega uh, in, in Spain, uh, and then you go out all across the Pacific. And, and basically, they're, they're all located um, primarily down to the maintenance agreements that they're covering. So there's an Atlantic Cable Maintenance Agreement, which covers multiple cables. Uh, there are privately, uh, there's, there's Global Marine that does global crossing cables and so on. Uh, but in, in the main, they are they're strategically placed to get to the faults as quickly as possible. The cable depots have to house multiple cable systems, multiple lengths of fiber, uh, different repeaters. And so when you hear somebody say it's going to take three weeks to fix a fault, uh, it, it's primarily mobilization of ships, getting them to the right place, getting them to the right depot for the cable system, uh, getting them out into, uh, into the ocean, and quite frequently, you know, the middle of the Atlantic, uh, uh, even, even just 20, 30 miles offshore, uh, off, the, off the UK coast or off Brittany and France, it's pretty horrendous weather most of the time when they're, they're out at sea. So when I say specialist ships, these ships can move at one knot in very, very heavy seas in any direction. So, you know, they, they, they are looking to, uh, when they're laying the, the cable, they have to follow very, very precise uh, oceanographic surveys. Uh, when they're actually looking for the cable, they're using very rudimentary methods, grapnel, just to pick it up, uh, you know, find it, tension meters to de determine whether they've got a rock or whether they've got a cable or whether they've got a, an, an abandoned fishing net. So, it, 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 you know, it's a very rudimentary approach, but it's a very... Uh, uh, on a, on a high-tech system. Uh, the ROVs can go down to uh, 2,500 meters and uh, they can do some of the search and, and, and recovery. Uh, as I said, several key players, about 12 companies, Global Marine, Alcatel, Tycom, NTT, uh, and some specialist companies with specialist type ships for inland repair and inland laying. Uh, the, the ROV and the trenching machines uh, as Samia mentioned, many of the cables over the last uh, sort of 20 years have been buried as close as possible to shore and also where the environmentalists will allow you to, to, to trench. Uh, one of the biggest uh, issues is, is dragging anchors and uh, you'll find that prior to that with the old coaxial cables and some of the early fiber optics, they were basically just laid on the sand uh, and, and obviously that caused an awful lot of cable cuts. Uh, the, again, we're looking at the, the burying of them. The, the armored cable that I showed you is uh, probably uh, suitable for depths up to about 1,000 meters. As you get closer and closer to shore, the armoring becomes thicker and thicker, and ultimately you end up with steel casing. And the casing is, is basically interlocked and, and around that, that sort of diameter. Uh, I couldn't carry an example, it's very, very heavy. Uh, but certainly uh, the, the armoring and trenching is what uh, prevents many of the cable cuts close to shore. And again, the ROVs are used for uh, inspecting the terrain on the geographical survey, or the oceanographic survey before they lay it, and then after they've laid it, they go back out and make sure it's in the right spot, and there are no crossings. And, and there are Notably, there are a lot of cable crossings, as you'll see from some of the maps, but most of the, uh, the crossings and exactly where they are on the ocean floor is known, and that becomes very important as they, they go out and they look to trawl and pick up those cables when they need to repair them. So cable faults. Uh, you've probably heard the term shunt fault. Jolt is not often used, but basically what I showed you is, is external aggression where the, the cable's been belt, bent, and I'll show you a couple of examples. And, and again, it's, it's down to the attenuation. The cable may not be broken, uh, but, the, but the actual system is impaired. And, and then it takes all of the planning to take that system out of service, go and find the cable, uh, and uh, pull it up and repair it. Same thing with the shunt fault. Shunt fault is, is typically an anchor has caused it, where it, it hasn't actually cut the cable but it's eaten through the cable into the copper core and you're starting to get a ground from the, uh, the power system. And that usually causes one end of the power system to have to uh, close down. Um, 
so you don't get any, any damage to your power generation equipment. And in some systems, uh, the Trans-Pacific, for example, they have to be dual end fed. Uh, because of the distance, you have to feed it from both cable stations. Uh, some shorter systems, you can get away with single end feeding a cable. Uh, but shunt fault is probably the most common. And again, traffic will often be impaired. There's a danger to the system, and, and you have to make arrangements to reroute traffic and, and repair the cable. And then obviously a cable break is uh, immediate restoration. And, and then I, the, the, the activities around the planning of restoration, uh, there, there are terms that you may hear from, from carriers uh, from time to time. The cable administrator is, the, is, is in a consortia, is a, a designated party who manages all the capacity for all the owners of the system, where it goes, which fiber uh, pair it goes on, or which equipment it's placed on. And they then uh, do all of the administration of the, uh, of, of the cable system uh, and, and traffic uh, rerouting. And you'll see RCO and RLO. Uh, um, RCO is the uh, restoration coordinator, and RLO is the restoration liaison officer. Two different functions. The liaison officer is the guy who's dealing with the ships, and the, commercial, uh, the uh, coordination is dealing with all the owners of the capacity. So here's a, an example of a jolt where you, you can see it's uh, you know, almost like a kink in a hose pipe, uh, but it's enough to uh, cause uh, attenuation on the fiber and uh, a repair after a period of time. Uh, here's a more severe jolt, almost like the one down here. And you can see the armoring is starting to get damaged and uh, again, uh, needs, needs a repair. This is a cable break. Um, where, you know, we found one end of the cable, but not the other. And uh, he's basically uh, using the techniques that Samir mentioned. You go, you pick up one end, you uh, bring it to the surface, buoy it off, and then you go and look for the, uh, the other end, bring it up, buoy it off, splice a piece in between, and, and throw it back overboard. Uh, all sounds very simple, but the, once it's on, on the deck of a cable ship, as I just showed you, uh, you, you get into x-ray machines because of the pressure of the, the joint. Uh, the, the, you know, the joint is a regular fiber joint as if it was in the street or in the office, but uh, it, it has to be done in very, very clean conditions in a very, very unclean environment on the back of a ship. And, and then it has to be uh, pressure treated and sealed and just the very minutest of, uh, of, of cavities or ga uh, gaps and they have to start all over again. So it, it becomes a very high-tech environment on the, the, the deck of the ship. This is a, an example of, uh, of, a, of a cable break where all of the, uh, uh, the armor has been completely lost. And here's where you've got evidence of a fishing net. So you, you know exactly where the culprit is. This is one that came up earlier this year in uh, Western Europe. So uh, I think, uh, as, as we've mentioned, the main culprits are trawling in less than 1,000 meters and, uh, and ships dragging anchor. The CME V4 and the flag fault were reported to be one ship dragging across a, a length of about four kilometers. Uh, and it, it was refused entry into port in, in very heavy seas and, and put its anchor down and dragged it right across two cables. Uh, we, we, I talked a little bit about backhaul systems. Uh, we, we, always, you know, we always think it's going to happen to somebody else. Uh, and, and, you know, we had the, the Taiwanese earthquake, which resulted in uh, 22 earthquakes. Oh, sorry, 22 earthquakes. 22 uh, cable breaks. And uh, we, we've also had, um, down in the Caribbean, one of the hurricanes took out a landing station entirely. It was uh, far too close to the beach. This example here, is one of our cable systems, and this is actually closer to home. It's in Oregon. Uh, it's one of the backhaul sections from Nedona Beach into Portland, and it runs through beautiful countryside, uh, but as you can see, we had many, many mudslides, and we're talking probably three, three years in total to repair this because, as you can see, it's along the railroad track, and they have to, re they have to fix the railroad first before we can actually relay a cable along those rights away. So that, that's really, it's quite dramatic, as, as you can see, there were multiple segments. So, you know, when, when it comes to 
uh, your planning, uh, it, it's very important that uh, backhaul is also considered, it's not just the cable landing. If we talk about the different types of systems, if it's a consortia system, usually the owners of the initial capacity and the funders of the cable, the likes of AT&T, ourselves in, in, in India, uh, the, the likes of BT, uh, Verizon, they will normally be the primary backhaul providers. So they will bring this, the capacity back to, to a city, New York or, uh, or, or uh, Washington. In a privately owned system, uh, if you buy into this, the uh, buy capacity in, in 10G increments on the system, you can actually build into the cable system yourself. And as you can see, if you put all your eggs in one basket on one route, then uh, th this sort of thing can happen. It can take a very long time to recover. We actually have two routes back from the cable landing station in Nodona, so we've been able to uh, overbuild on the second route to restore traffic. But it, it does cause uh, some, some significant delay in bringing up capacity again. Uh, the, the, all of these are examples of, of uh, Oregon. The one on the, the, the bottom right is where very, very heavy seas have actually uncovered the armored uh, cable at the beachhead. So again, it, it just goes to, this, this one didn't actually result in a, in a cable problem. It's a little hard to see, but you can see the, uh, the pipe work surrounding it. Uh, and, and again, uh, the uh, power of the ocean uh, on the shoreline is, is quite incredible. So uh, th hence the need to do the trenching. Get to products and services uh, that run over the cable systems. Uh, IRUs, indefeasible right of usage. Um, whoever came up with that name, I, I, I don't know, but it's about 30, 40 years old. Uh, usually 15 years. You buy a circuit for 15 years. It's prepaid. Uh, you pay operations and maintenance charges based upon your proportion of ownership in the cable. So, you know, quite, quite straightforward. Uh, if an annual maintenance charge is a million dollars then you, and you've got 10% of the cable, you, you pay 10%. So the key is that the owner of the capacity takes the risk and the reward. And this is one of the things people will bandy around IRU as a term. Uh, but it, by buying into it, if the cable breaks, the cable breaks. There's no recourse on the owner. Uh, the other issue with uh, IRUs is they're supposed to be between two fixed points. So you're buying it from New York to London. You're not buying it from London to Washington or New York to Paris. You can't change your mind halfway through. So these, these are the key elements of, of IRUs. And um, you know, there, there are uh, what I would term enterprise customers and ISPs who are buying IRUs because they do lower the cost of ownership and uh, they do fit into certain business models. But key is that the risk and reward transfers with you and uh, there's, there's no real SLA. If the cable's down for three, uh, three weeks, it, it's down for three weeks. MIUs is another term, minimum investment unit. Uh, in uh, probably 19, uh, 1990, E1 was a minimum investment unit and that carried on probably for about 15 years. Uh, in the late 90s, STM1 started to be the minimum investment unit and that's uh, 63 E1s and uh, subsequent systems from 98 with uh, AC1, Yellow, uh, Gemini, uh, SCM4, SCM16 started to become more prevalent. At that time in the late 90s, the systems were limited to 2.5G capability and multiple 2.5s, and as you have heard now, it's multiple 10Gs uh, in, in tranches of up to uh, 80, 96 on a fiber per. So the minimum investment unit now is typically uh, STM16 or 10G. The, the other services obviously are lease services. I think you all have heard the term IPLC, International Private Leased Circuit. Uh, managed private lines, uh, IPLCs I'll talk a little bit more about in a second. Managed private lines tend to be uh, an, an owner who has managed to uh, secure licenses in different countries, buys the underlying capacity, builds the POPs in the different countries, and manages uh, the service provided to the customer on an end-to-end -end basis. Uh, capital leases, uh, another uh, obviously example where you're prepaying for a five-year term uh, and obviously getting uh, a discount and uh, uh, for term and for bulk buying. 
uh, DS0 to 10 gigabits. So least circuit could be 64 kilobits, uh, which is a 30th of an E1, or it could be all the way up to a 10 gig, uh, a, a 10 gigabit wavelength, or even uh, a, an STM64 protected, which would be uh, a, a two 10Gs uh, put into transmission equipment for protection. Ethernet private line becoming very, very uh, prevalent these days. Uh, not necessarily eating into the higher end of the lease market, but certainly starting to eat into frame ATM uh, and also as an alternative to MPLS, layer two and layer three MPLS services. And uh, e Ethernet is becoming much, much more prevalent. Uh, still a challenge on uh, the, the varieties of local access flavors that we have. Uh, that, that you can buy whether it's contended, uncontended, Ethernet access and so on, but uh, it, it very, very fast growing segment. Uh, VPLS, virtual private line running over layer three uh, MPLS services. I'm sure you're all familiar with that and running it on your own networks. Uh, again, unprotected wavelengths, which is the core fundamental of, uh, of all of our cable systems these days. Uh, again, unprotected uh, carries a high risk in that uh, your cable, if it's unprotected, it could be down for, for a number of weeks. So it, it's very, very important in that respect to buy on uh, protected uh, or resilient or diverse systems. And the other, the other thing that is uh, probably more pertinent to you is at the moment we can, uh, most cable systems can now do 10 gigabit ethernet uh, and map it onto SDH and Sonic equipment, uh, but also most of them have got the, uh, the LANFI capability uh, either launched or coming out. So that actually lowers your cost of uh, optics significantly when you start to be able to uh, get those services from the carriers. The most common IPL service, uh, the, the, again, the carriers providing the end-to-end -end service in a managed private line. All protection schemes uh, are possible and uh, it's, it's, it's always available on, on all the, the uh, primary routes in the network. Uh, IPLCs have been a mainstay of, uh, uh, of data revenue for, for carriers for probably nigh on 30 years. And uh, managed private lines, Ethernet, as I say, is, is ramping up and taking over from some of the E1s and DS3 private lines that we see. Uh, it's common on, on most of the consortia cables where one carrier provides half the, the capacity. For example, a, a, an AT&T would contract with you. If it's a circuit to India, uh, then as we are the, uh, the, the, the one of the uh, regulated uh, carriers and um, licensed carriers in India, we would provide the other half. There's a permutation of contracts, whether you, uh, you, you it, whether you, well, the, the, the situation is you have to sign a contract in both countries. So your legal entity in India would have to sign a contract with, with Tata legal entity in the US would have to sign a contract with AT&T, but then you have a permutations on, do you want single end billing, single end fault reporting, and that coordination goes on behind the scenes by the carriers. It, it's a very labor intensive uh, process for carriers to continue to work this way, especially as many carriers are, are getting licenses in most of the countries and can provide end-to-end -end service themselves, and uh, you know why, why share the profits, um, and why, why share the, uh, uh, the, the revenue with, with the other carriers. So that, that is, it, it, this is really phasing out. Half circuits are phasing out. There's still many of them out there, uh, but, but, but it, is, uh, it, it tends to be DS zeros, sub T1, sub E1 type of uh, IPLs. Uh, un unprotected service is typical in that uh, if you have designated an IPLC on a particular cable path, uh, there is no automatic restoration you typically will pay a premium for automatic restoration. For example, CMU E4 going down, only certain bearers have been designated as automatically protected on CMU E3. Uh, and in the situation that we all ran into, uh, uh, some restoration have been procured on flag. So CMU E4 goes down, flag goes down, there's no third option. So restoration, uh, as it says, may be available by the consortium. Uh, an alternate cable may be re available via consortium, but when you're buying an IPLC, it's absolutely critical you understand uh, what restoration is provided. Uh, protection, auto prefer, 
uh, auto um, protection service provision with uh, un unprotected two fiber handoff. Uh, typically, most ISPs only want two fiber handoff. They don't have transmission equipment, they only have a router, they don't have one plus one protection. You're buying unrestored routes from, from multiple operators. So, this is typically what we would supply to, to ISPs. Uh, whereas four fiber would be if a carrier is buying an STM16 to set up his own network, or a large enterprise is putting uh, some, some optical switching in place where they want one plus one protection and expect us to provide the underlying route protection. Restored service, again, manually restored. It can take anywhere from one, one, once uh, a cable break is suspected, and traffic has to be moved, as, as we talked about earlier. The, uh, the restoration coordination kicks in, the uh, RLO kicks in, and this is where you have predetermined plans in place between carriers as to which system you're going to, do, to use, and then you start to uh, implement your restoration plan by meeting that carrier at various alternate points, various alternate cable systems. So this can take, this is again very manually, uh, uh, very manually coordinated with phone calls between Knox and uh, uh, reading up on plans and, and, and implementing switches in the network and it can take anywhere from 30 minutes to, to four hours. With, rest, with consortium arranged uh, when they're moving massive amounts of traffic, it can take up to 15 hours. Again, unprotected service, uh, unprotected handoff to you, the customer, and uh, also if, if the cable system goes down and you bought unprotected, you're down for the long, length of the cable repair. Service level agreements, I think uh, everybody will be uh, fairly familiar. These are uh, basic level, uh, service level agreements. Premium protected service, uh, anywhere from five minutes to uh, uh, four hours, you, you get a percentage based on your monthly recurring charges, percentage credit, and uh, uh, you know increments from that point on. Uh, and as you can see, with uh, when, when it gets into subsequent 24-hour periods, um, that that's a that that is a very challenging situation for a carrier when a, a customer's bought premium protected and they're down for longer than 24 hours. Uh, same thing, uh, pr premium protected could be uh, a mesh protection. For example, uh, across the Atlantic where there are probably seven different cable systems uh, and, and carriers build diversity and, and capacity on each of them, uh, they can employ optical switching where you could have one for end protection rather than your traditional Sonnet or SDH where it's one plus one protection. Protected is your, your typical one plus one and unprotected as, as, as you say, no credit for uh, almost four hours, and um, uh, above four hours, you start to get into uh, Meteor uh, credits and rebates. Talking a little bit about network operators, consortium examples are all cables you're familiar with. You'll have heard the names, TAP14, CMUE4, Japan US, APCN2 across around the a Asian region, and then wholly owned, which has been, uh, um, has grown, this, this sector has grown significantly in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, with, with Tata, which uh, uh, some of you may know, we, we, um, uh, the Tata Group uh, bought the Tyco Global Network about three, four years ago. Uh, the intra-Asia cable which we're building, uh, Tata Indicom is India to Singapore, Apollo is uh, UK and France to New Jersey and Long Island, two separate fiber systems, uh, two fe separate fiber lays uh, joined together as one system. Hibernia is from Southport in uh, north of Liverpool and uh, Dublin across to Halifax and Lim. Uh, 360 uh, Americas is uh, New Jersey, Bermuda to uh, Brazil. Global Crossing have multiple cables uh, in, in uh, uh, mid-Atlantic, South Atlantic and uh, across the Pacific and also down in South America. Uh, Flag, uh, Reliance Global Com, uh, many, many systems uh, throughout the Mediterranean into the Middle East and, and uh, around into Asia. Uh, Gemini, uh, Bermuda and Hugo, and uh, Columbus Networks, which is the example I gave you. Columbus is uh, around uh, the, the Caribbean, and they are doing an awful lot of work in, uh, in multiple countries through from, from 
Miami, Dominican Republic, down to Venezuela, all back through Central America. I'll talk a little bit more about Gemini, uh, Bermuda, and, and Hugo in a second. Very interesting. Uh, <clears throat> what, looking ahead, the, uh, as uh, Samia mentioned, there's uh, an awful lot of uh, money goes into a cable system. Uh, uh, Gemini Bermuda was a relay of an old Gemini system. And when I say old, it was laid and commissioned in 1998, and it was taken out of service in 2004 with a 25-year lifespan. Uh, the interesting thing is it, it was only 2.5G capable for that distance across the Atlantic, but as Apollo came in, Hibernia came in, uh, Tycho came in, the capacity and the cost, of, the cost per unit uh, was dwarfed. And uh, Gemini was a joint venture between MCI and, uh, and Cable and Wireless. And basically it was retired, everything put into mothballs, the cable landing stations, and the cable was laying on the ocean. Uh, it was determined that with the optical amplification, it could be reused and just refitted at the cable station to put multiple 10Gs onto it. And basically, the cable was, uh, the southern leg of the cable from New Jersey to the UK was cut in the middle, and half from the UK was relayed to Guernsey and into France into an existing landing station, and the other half from New Jersey, the existing landing station, was relayed down to Bermuda. And that cut the cost of laying a new cable, single threaded cable to Bermuda in half, uh, be, be basically because there was no uh, permitting, no trenching at either end, no cable building. There was only the re-equipping of the line terminating equipment and some of the power supplies. So um, it, it, it's become an interesting uh, concept in the industry that you can actually, if the life of the cable is, all, is less than 10 years, you can actually pick it up and reuse it. Uh, there, are, there are new cables um, that, that are being deployed, and I'll talk about a few of those. System upgrades, as uh, Samir mentioned, tranches of 16, 32 wavelengths at a time on multiple fiber pairs. And uh, we're, we're also, uh, the, there's a 200 million in, uh, investment in the intra-Asia cable, and th this will give you a, a sort of guide on the, the route distance, the number of branching units, and what you get for your $200 million. So this, this is the uh, intra-Asia cable. Uh, it, it runs from Singapore with branching unit uh, for Vietnam, Hong Kong, Philippines. And this is where we're branching into the existing Tokyo-Guam cable. So really it's, it's, uh, it's from Singapore to somewhere in the uh, midpoint between Tokyo and Guam with a new branching unit. And that is uh, going to start on the 17th of June. The importance of this as I, as I step through is when you look at it in perspective of the earthquakes. Mo the, uh, most of the cable systems that are overlaid on it uh, all ran through the Taiwan Straits. And what, what the cable is, uh, the survey has done is take it as far away from that, uh, that, that uh, seismic uh, activity as possible. So it, not only is it um, uh, an important cable for Philippines and Vietnam, but it's also very important for uh, as much diversity as possible from all the existing cable systems. Uh, the other one is uh, Eurasia, which is coming in 2009, 9,000 kilometers, 1.28 terabits. Uh, again, leveraging existing landing stations. Uh, IMEWI uh, in 2009, uh, very similar routing. Uh, this one is more of a, a consortia cable. Uh, the Seacom cable going up uh, the east coast of Africa. Again, uh, Beyond the, the existing branching, there, there could be more branching units uh, on that cable system coming in the second half of 2009. The uh, Trans-Pacific e Express, which is uh, China, Korea, Taiwan, and into uh, Oregon, uh, which should be ready for the Olympics. The Asia-America Gateway, multiple countries, uh, coming in in 2009. So there's a, as you can see, the trend here is a, uh, from, from the early 2000s where everybody shied away and, 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 and moved away from investing in cable systems. With the, the capacity growth, there's a need to invest again. Hundreds of millions of dollars. Others are CFX1, which is US, uh, Jamaica, Colombia, which is going to dissect the Arcos ring, which spans all the way through 
as I mentioned earlier, Miami, uh, Bahamas, Turks and Caicos, going all the way around the Eastern Caribbean, back through Central America, Panama, Guatemala. So this one uh, dissects it and creates a couple of express routes for that system. Pipe, which is Australia, Papua New Guinea uh, to Guam. Uh, again, there's, there's limited uh, cable capacity uh, out of Australia and New Zealand with uh, Southern Cross and uh, AJC, uh, Australia Japan cable. So that's a, a, a big addi addition for Australia. Hugo, as I mentioned, UK Guernsey France, which was a relay, and Gemini Bermuda, which was a relay of the Gemini cable system. Uh, the Europe-India Gateway, uh, as you can see, an awful lot going on through the Middle East and, and, uh, and connecting India to, uh, to Europe for the shortest possible route also on to the US. Teams, the East African Marine System, which is, uh, as Samir mentioned, in this instance, government uh, funded and, and backed, which makes it ever more challenging, uh, but between the UAE and Africa. Unity, which is a, a, a smaller consortia, a less traditional consortia, uh, is connecting the US to Japan with uh, a ready for service date in 2010. The, there are a few others, but uh, those are the major ones that uh, are of uh, primary interest on the main routes. And with that, thank you. So at this point, uh, we can take questions. You can just come to the microphone and we will answer your questions. Everything clear. Did I put you to sleep? <laughs> Anton Capella, Five Nines Data. I'm curious about the power uh, for undersea repeaters. Is, is that one single conductor between them and like a positive end in one continent, negative in the other? Or what, what's the makeup of that? Do you want to talk about ground earths? Very rudimentary. Uh, it, it, every system has a, uh, a very significant uh, earth at the, uh, at the beach manhole. Um, it, it, it's quite, that's really the, uh, the long and short of it. It's, it, it's a very deep um, built ground earth, just like you would see at a data center. I, I, I'm thinking, though, um I guess my question is, how, how do you get a voltage differential between, you know, the either end of that cable, or, or is the entire, you know, conductive path forward and back in the same same sheath? And I guess I, it wasn't clear in the slides there. You you actually have a power feed equipment coming on both ends, and you you really um, you balance. You you ba basically you have, you know, you have a. You have a voltage differential, sure. At any, you know, but you balance it so you come on each end because it's actually pretty long. That's what maybe this is your curiosity, right? Yeah, exactly. I guess right. it, it, it wasn't obvious if you put, you know, positive and negative, if you will, co coaxially or triaxially, whatever, down the cable, or if it was continentally differential. So it's it's actually a differential. So you come from both ends and you actually balance the line. Okay. At I, some point in the cable. That, that was the intuition, but it wasn't. Thank you. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> Uh, Sean Dallin. Um, on the restoration and the protection alternatives you mentioned, um, what do you find is, is it usually the user's choice um, that, they, that the outages end up re uh, from cable problems end up resulting in services outages? It's the user's choice or are there other issues resulting in uh, the restoration protection not quite working? It's if, if you look at an IPLC and the, the, the traditional method of, uh, of, of restoration, the most en enterprise customers, for example, a bank, would expect automatic restoration with SDM1 and above type services. That, that's, uh, that's almost a given. With some of the slower speeds, they would expect the carrier of choice to, prepare, uh, to provide restoration for the service. And that would be the one to the four hour type of, of arrangement where it's already pre-organized and, and restored. When you get to the, the ISPs, the biggest question becomes latency. And restoration routes tend to be quite a lot longer than the initial route. So what, we've, what my experience is that most ISPs will buy a point-to-point -point unprotected service 
and then buy another on a different route from another carrier and do their own load balancing restoration, uh, whichever term, uh, and, and take an account for the peak capacity and what they need to, to be running at any given time on a, on a chosen route. So in that instance, it's th they expect on occasion that the, the, the circuit will go down, but they prefer to determine their own backup route because they can then uh, narrow down the latency uh, differential between route A and route B. If we do it for them as a, as a carrier, it could be, you know, uh, the, the, the differential latency is of our choosing and, uh, and that becomes difficult for the ISP to manage. On uh, land-based systems, uh, grooming is often an issue. Um, the carriers will groom uh, the circuits to different cables without telling the user a lot of times. Uh, on the undersea cables, uh, just because there's fewer of them, is grooming less of a problem? On the undersea cables, I think carriers that use one for end protection do have that issue of grooming to different cable systems. Uh, it, it's it's unusual if if you prescribed a route for grooming to affect you. And we we you know, certainly uh, most of the unprotected wave sails are, are on a prescribed route, whether it's a, an STM16 unprotected or whether it's a 10G protected. They tend to be known exactly which route they're on, and um, unless there is a uh, a commercial arrangement that, that allows a, a one-off restoration for some work that's going on to move them onto a different segment or a different route, it is unusual for, for unprotected waves to move diff between cable systems. Hi, uh, Brian Nixon, Affilius, uh, formerly with Teleglobe a long time ago. Um, for the cable landing component, um, obviously there's trenching that goes in to get it up to the, the actual uh, terrestrial facility. Um, is it reaching the point where there's enough new cables going in that for some terrestrial locations, putting in the equivalent of, of a large conduit for the, the, the shore landing uh, would make sense? I mean, with, when you do uh, terrestrial digs, typically they'll put in a, a, a large uh, conduit and then pull fiber through it. Uh, is that something that makes sense in a, a landing situation for undersea? It, it has been done where multiple ducts are, are run from the beach landing to accommodate new cables coming into it. Yeah, that, that is part of the, the foresight that goes into it. Interesting. Uh, each, each cable from the beach manhole, each cable system does have its own unique backhole path, which is typically, you know, it, some, some of the beach landings may be half a block in, and as we saw, Cancun got washed out or they could be three, four miles inland, or even even greater. But that conduit from the beach manhole to the uh, the, the landing station is, is typically a, a, a single route, completely independent of any onward backhaul uh, terrestrial system to the major city pops. It's completely independent because it is running power also, whereas typical fiber optics is not. Um, completely unrelated question. Uh, what about the uh, the new technology coming down the pipe, uh, 100 gig? Um, are you guys planning for that uh, on the undersea systems? I believe it's right now they're talking about 40 gig, right? Well, for, 40 gig terrestrial is already in, in service, right. but uh, I, I haven't seen any examples of, 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 of 100 gig in, in the in You're the pipe talking yet. about single channel 100 gig? Yes. yes. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's really in development right now, yeah. and I know you know, in terrestrial, they've done ultra-long haul system for 40, at 40 gig. But again, remember, when you apply them to undersea, you're talking about really providing the reliability and also the cost effectiveness. Because when you go the longer distances, you have some, some, uh, some non-linearity and dispersion effect in the fiber that have to be mitigated. So it's a little bit more complicated. Vikas AOL, uh, it appears to me that the repeater is a single point of failure. Is that true? Uh, I'm sorry, Vikas, what was that? Is, uh, it appears to me that the repeater is a single point of failure. Is that true? 
in a linear segment, uh, absolutely, yes, it, it is. And that, hence the, uh, the very, very extremely high mean time between failure on, on repeaters. Uh, I, the, the example that I showed you without uh, touting somebody else's product, but uh, they, they claim not to have ha ever had a repeater failure. And that's a, a Japanese company, NEC. And d just to complement this section, so repeater, f so the cable failure will take out the repeater, obviously, right? I mean, when you, you, you have the cable cut. Within the repeater, you have redundancies. Not only the, the quality and reliability of the components that go in it, but the actual design. Let's say if an amplifier fail, you have some redundant paths within the repeater. Oh, okay, all right, thanks. Tony Tauber, Comcast. Uh, d doesn't need to be a long answer because I know it's just about to be break, but uh, what about decommissioning? Do they ever, e well, I'm sure things end their lifetime at some point, and do they ever decommission things earlier than their expected end because the technology is just not really worth the investment? It's gotten so slow and you know, small capacity that, that it's really not even worth powering anymore. Gemini was a good, good example of that. It, it lived for six years on, on a, a planned life of uh, 25, and it was both the well, segment of it was both decommissioned and then reused. In terms of decommissioning and picking up the cable, uh, I, I personally haven't seen any examples, but I, I know there are companies that uh, will recover cable. Uh, were, were, were absolutely necessary, and, and most of the contracts do have clauses that uh, the, the, the cable has to be, uh, should be recovered at the cable operator's cost uh, if directed by a, a governmental agency. But it, it's, it's a little vague and, and not too many of the cables have actually been picked up and recovered and, and recycled in, in the traditional sense of recycling. Hi, Keith Wong, Connective. Uh, one question, it seemed like you showed a lot of new uh, fiber builds can you put that in context with the history? Is it uh, a lot more than it could now in 2008 through 2010? And uh, second part to that, how does that change the pricing dynamics for Transatlantic, Transpacific? Obviously, uh, in, when you say in the context of the street, uh, the investments that are going in? No, uh, in context of historical uh, fiber builds. Because it just seems like there's a ton of new projects coming on board. I can take that. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, there has been, uh, there, there was a lot of fiber constructions in the early 90s, yeah. and it created what we called in, Indi in the industry the fiber glut. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There was an abundance of fiber everywhere. Um, and then uh, the dot com boom happened, and the bust happened and a lot of carriers went bankrupt and cable operators went belly up. And that inventory of submarine systems stayed on. And it's only now, six years after, that we have finally exhausted the uh, excess capacity in the submarine cables. And that is why you're seeing, this is quite unbelievable, like in the past 18 months or 12 months, there's been a lot of announcements a lot of people wanting to buy cables uh, or build cables and the growth is truly in Asia where the internet is finally booming and this is what is driving the cable demand um, for new systems. So all these investments, if you, if you look at the investment path, they all have either China or India as, as landing points and, and those are the sought after routes and you would be hard pressed right now to find some available capacity transpacific. So all these new uh, systems are coming on. So I think it's just natural economics of offer and demand. We finally exhausted the inventory, uh, which created rarity and now it's spurred more, more projects to take on. Okay, excellent. And does that mean pricing will begin to come down transpacific? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it will. I'm sure you can talk to your account managers. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's kind of ironic that you can get a transatlantic 10G for less than a DS3 from New York to uh, Harrisburg. So, are there any more questions? Did you finally learn what you wanted to learn about submarine systems? 
Thank you very much, Samia Bashun and Paul Kerwin, for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. you have shown great examples, great pictures, and your explanations were very clear. Thank you so much.